Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this <coughs> evening's talk. My name is Dr. John Hittinger. I'm a professor at the University of St. Thomas and the director of the John Paul II Forum for the Church in the Modern World. I'd like to begin by thanking Father Schwentzer and Father Fulton and everybody at St. Thomas High School for their gracious uh, invitation to use the facilities here. I knew that George Weigel would draw a good crowd and I, I just thought it would be good to come up here to have more room and also to show that connection between the bazillion institutions. Steve Meyer is a faculty member here who's on the board of the John Paul II Forum. So we are delighted to be at St. Thomas High School. I'd also like to thank the Knights of Columbus because I know they've promoted this talk. I'm a knight in the Holy Rosary Council and uh, we know the Knights have a great uh, attachment for the Pope. Also, the students and faculty at the University of St. Thomas. And that is one of the reasons I think uh, our speaker tonight will help demonstrate or just show what the John Paul II Forum and the Center for Thomistic Studies are all about, is we would like to see the renewal of the church and the renewal of society by drawing on the great legacy of blessed John Paul II. Mr. Weigel's book, Witness to Hope, is really a, a groundbreaking book and still the book to read on Pope John Paul II. It will soon be rendered into its 15th language, and certainly in English it's been a bestseller. And uh, Mr. Weigel explains in the beginning of that book how he came to be the biographer of John Paul II. He suggested that uh, to some people in the Vatican the need to have a good biography. And um, at some point people realized he was the man to write it. He's got a background in philosophy and theology, political science, and he uh, spent many hours with blessed John Paul II talking about his life. He went to Poland and has done a lot of work, particularly in this new book, seeing how the Polish secret police had uh, reams of material on the Pope. Was it 22 miles worth of, a lot of, stuff. of materials? And so he does know the life and work of John Paul II very well. I met George in 1990, I was um, fortunate to be part of a group around Father Newhouse. It was called the Ramsey Colloquium, named after the late Paul Ramsey, in which an ecumenical group of scholars were convened a couple times a year to talk about theological, philosophical matters, including the work of John Paul II. I've always been impressed with George's ability to work these different areas, philosophy, theology, politics, cultural studies, and so on. So it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you tonight to hear George Weigel, who will speak about two popes and one mission, Blessed John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI. After the talk, we'll have time for some questions. If you would approach the microphone, we will entertain some questions, and then after that, there will be, um, he, George will be available to sign books in the foyer if you um, take advantage of Veritas Bookstore's um, wares out there. He'll be glad to sign a book. So let me, um, would you join me then in, in, in welcoming George Weigel to St. Thomas High School in Houston, Texas. George. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hittinger, and to, to Dr. Mary Catherine Summers uh, for their hosting this event. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here under the auspices of the John Paul II Forum and the Center for Thomistic Studies. 
I think it was 1997 when I was walking, working on Witness to Hope, I came down to Houston and Dr. Summers organized a conversation for me with two other faculty members about <clears throat> John Paul II and women and this distinctive Catholic feminism, papal feminism that was being articulated. And I can't remember whether it was you, Mary Catherine, but someone said to me at the end of this very interesting conversation about Molieris Dignitatum and uh, the Pope's letter to women and this and the other thing, the next time you see your buddy the Pope, tell him we're not the problem, men are. <laughs> <coughs> was that you? I think it was you. I, I, I've been giving you credit for that line for 15 years and I just, I gave you credit for it with your daughter in Washington a couple of weeks ago, so I, I wanted to make sure. Um, let's uh, actually begin with something striking about the future. Uh, we already know one thing for sure about the next Pope. No matter how long Pope Benedict XVI lives, no matter when the conclave meets, no matter whom it elects, no matter what life experience that man has had, we already know one thing about him, and that is that he will not have attended the Second Vatican Council. Indeed, should Pope Benedict live as long as Pope Leo XIII, to whom I'm going to avert several times this evening, Leo died at age 93. Shortly before he died, I should mention that an American bishop was over on his quinquennial ad limita visit to Rome, and he met with the then 91-year-old Leo XIII, and they had a talk for about a half an hour, and then the American bishop was getting all teary at the end and saying, Your Holiness, I suspect this will be the last time we see each other in this world. And the 91-year-old Pope leaned over and patted the bishop on the arm and said, my dear man, you didn't tell me you were feeling poorly. <laughs> Whether Benedict XVI lasts as long as Leo XIII or whether God takes him to his reward sooner, no matter when any of this happens, uh, the next Pope will not have been at the Second Vatican Council, and indeed should Benedict XVI equal Leo XIII in longevity, the next Pope might not even have been born at the time of the Second Vatican Council, or would have been in elementary school at the time. Now, for those of us of a certain age, this is a very difficult idea to wrap our heads around. This is the central event of our Catholic lives, uh, as indeed it was the central event of a moment in church history. But that very fact that the next pope, whoever he is, will not have been at Vatican II is an indicator, rather clear indicator, that a period is coming to an end in the life of the church and another period is about to be born. The question I want to explore this evening is what is the period that is coming to an end and to what has it been leading us? And my basic suggestion is that we have to widen the historical lens and see that Second Vatican Council which looms so large on the horizon of most of, the, most of our Catholic imaginations, at least those of us of a certain age here. We have to widen the historical lens and see the Council and the pontificates of Benedict XVI and John Paul II not as an event that simply happened by itself, but to see it as a crucial moment in a defined period of church history which is now drawing to a close, giving birth to a new period. My suggestion is that with the pontificate of Benedict XVI, a great historical 
arc, if you will, is coming to an end. That arc begins in 1878 with the election of Vincenzo Gioacchino Pecci as Leo XIII, and that arc that begins in 1878 runs down to our own time. The arc is one of deep and sometimes quite difficult reform in the church. A deep reform that is, even as we meet tonight, bringing to an end the era of counter-reformation Catholicism and giving birth to what I and others have come to call evangelical Catholicism. Moreover, I believe that this long arc of historical reform, this long arc of deep reform, is not an accident of historical circumstances. Rather, this arc of historical reform running from 1878 down into our own time is an action of the Holy Spirit prompting the church to preach the gospel and put that evangelical mission of preaching the gospel at the heart of its pastoral life and to do so in response to dramatically different cultural situation in which we must hand on the faith in the late uh, period of modernity and the very dramatically different cultural situation in which all of us are called to bear witness to the central truth of history that Jesus is Lord. This new situation is one most of us have begun to sense coming into play over the course of our own lifetimes. It's not a question any longer of a neutral public culture living off the capital of its Christian past. That was, it now seems, the world in which many of us grew up 50 or 60 years ago. The public culture was not overtly Christian uh, in many respects, but it was not hostile to the faith, and in, its, in the virtues it lifted up, in the habits it deplored, in the way it taught us to treat with each other, it was clearly dependent on biblical roots. Today, we face an increasingly toxic and hostile culture, which is not neutral towards the faith, is hostile to it, and seeks through various levers, including coercive state power, to drive religious believers and religious institutions to the margins of our society. In other words, we face a situation in which the culture no longer helps transmit the faith. Those of you who have read my little book, Letters to a Young Catholic, know that it begins with a, an elegiac chapter about growing up in Baltimore in the 1950s and early 60s in what now appears to have been one of the last moments of intact Catholic urban culture in America. Many of you uh, probably grew up in similar environments. It was an environment in which everything around us somehow transmitted bits and pieces of the faith. That intact Catholic culture of my hometown, those intact Catholic cultures, whether they were found in Boston or Philadelphia or San Antonio or Chicago or Ireland or Quebec or Bavaria, all shattered in the white water of the late 1960s. And that presents us with a new situation. If the culture is not going to transmit the faith, then the church has to re-enter the missionary business everywhere and with everyone. The church must now recover a sense of itself as an evangelical and missionary enterprise. We have to do the job. The culture is not going to do it for us, and in some respects, the culture is going to resist our proposal of the gospel. 
But to get a sense of this future of evangelical Catholicism that is opening up before us, I think it's important to return back uh, to the beginning of that arc of, of deep reform in the church, back to Leo XIII and his election in 1878. In 1878, things looked pretty grim for the Catholic Church and the papacy. The Papal States, that chunk of the middle of Italy that the Pope had controlled since the mid-first millennium, had been lost. Uh, Italy had been unified in 1870 with the seizure of Rome and the completion of the Italian Risorgimento. Pius IX had withdrawn inside the Apostolic Palace and had taken to calling himself the prisoner of the Vatican. And by the time of his death in 1878, after the longest pontificate in recorded history, some 32 years, it seemed to many of the great and the good uh, of Europe that the Catholic Church and the papacy were a spent force in history from which nothing much might be expected in the future. Indeed, there were such concerns about the degree of anti-clerical hysteria in Rome uh, at that moment in Italian history. Hysteria is not unknown to Italian history, as you may know, but anti-clerical <laughs> hysteria has uh, ups and downs. At this moment of anti-clerical hysteria, there's some question as to whether the conclave to elect the successor to Pius IX should even meet in Rome to the point where the English uh, Cardinal, Henry Edward Manning, proposed that the Cardinals pick themselves up and sail to Malta, where the conclave could meet peacefully under the guns of the Royal Navy. The notion of electing a pope under the guns of the Royal Navy is so thick with irony <laughs> that we could spend the rest of the evening uh, discussing that. In any event, they stayed in Rome, and rather quickly elected uh, the former Bishop of Perugia, who had been brought to Rome a year and a half before as the uh, Cardinal Camerlengo, a kind of senior Vatican manager, uh, a man named Vincenzo Gioacchino Pecci, who was 68 years old at the time, which in 1878 was being a really old guy. And so we can assume that by electing this almost septuagenarian, the conclave was putting in place what it imagined to be a kind of caretaker who would keep the chair warm and maybe fix a little bit of the broken machinery before a younger man could come to the uh, office of Peter in the future. Well, uh, that didn't quite work out because Pecci, who took the name Leo XIII, proceeded to enjoy the second longest pontificate in recorded history. He was topped by John Paul II eventually. But he, he was good to go for 25 years. And they were 25 years uh, of reform, which are in some very powerful and touching way symbolically embodied in his tomb, which is in the Basilica of St. John Lateran in Rome, which as you all know is actually the Pope's cathedral as the Bishop of Rome. And if you've been to the Lateran, you may remember that flanking the apse, the triumphal arch that enters into the, that frames the apse, there are two papal tombs. One is Innocent III, possibly the most politically powerful pope in history, a pope of the high Middle Ages. And he is portrayed in death in the usual funerary fashion. He's lying on his back with his hands piously folded uh, on top of his chest. On the left side of that apse is the tomb and monument of Leo XIII. And he is not lying. He's in fact standing up and he's got his right foot thrust forward and his right hand in the air as if he were saying to the world, 
let me propose something to you. That monument captures this historical pontificate and the Leonine reform that was set in motion in 1878 and which is reaching a kind of moment of completion uh, in our own time. Uh, that, that monument symbolizes that reform. Let me propose something to you in a very powerful way. What was this Leonine reform? It had many parts. Leo XIII recast the power of the papacy as a power of moral persuasion and witness. Thus it was in his pontificate that we begin to see articulated what we call the social doctrine of the church, which is not written and proclaimed in a theological vocabulary so much as a philosophical vocabulary. The Pope appealing to the world on grounds of public moral reason and the Pope appealing through proposal rather than edict. That tradition which begins in 1891 with the encyclical Rerum Novarum uh, continues down to our own time and indeed it was Leo XIII crafting this new way of popes interacting with the world. Popes interacting with the world through the persuasive power of moral reason who made possible those remarkable addresses of John Paul II at the UN in 1979 and 1995 and Benedict XVI in 2008. The Leonine reform was an attempt to engage the modern world intellectually, but with distinctively Catholic tools. Leo XIII promoted the revival of the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, instructed the church's philosophers and theologians to go back to the original texts of St. Thomas and read the man himself not try to deal with him simply through his commentators. Leo XIII, who created a project that remains unfinished in 2012, the so-called Leonine Commission, which was to pr uh, produce a definitive annotated uh, collection of all of the texts of uh, Thomas Aquinas. Leo did not propose, in other words, to hide from the new intellectual developments of modernity, the rise of natural science, as a paradigm for knowing everything, uh, the deconstructive tendencies of 19th century philosophy. Uh, he proposed to engage it, but he wanted to engage it in a distinctively Catholic way, and he saw in the philosophical and theological work of Thomas Aquinas uh, a fit tool for doing that. It was Leo XIII who opened the church to historical scholarship who opened the archives of the Vatican to qualified historians uh, and who began as well modern Catholic biblical studies seeking to find what could be gleaned from the historical critical study of the Bible uh, without uh, uh, completely uh, handing over biblical studies to that deconstructive uh, method. Leo XIII was a great defender of the rights of the church against aggressive secularism in Europe. When Leo XIII was elected, the, Bil the Bismarckian Kulturkampf was in full flood tide in Germany. Half the bishops of Germany were in jail. Uh, there were recurrent spasms of, of anti-clericalism in France, in Portugal, in Spain, in Italy itself, and Leo met that challenge with a powerful analysis of political modernity, the best modern work, the best contemporary work on which has been done by Dr. John Hittinger's brother, Dr. Russell Hittinger, while at the same time, Leo XIII worked very carefully and delicately and craftily to disentangle the church from what he had come to think of as the stifling embrace of the old regimes, even as he was exploring the possibility of a Catholic theory of religious freedom and democracy, because he could see in the church in the United States 
that a constitutional separation of the institutions of church and state could be good for the flourishing of the faith. That Leonine reform enacted over 25 years of a pontificate that created the modern papacy, set in motion everything that has followed in the church, both by way of reaction, because there were some people who didn't like this new engagement with modernity, and by way of development. Most particularly, the Leonine reform set in motion the great renaissance of Catholic intellectual life in the mid 20th century, in philosophy and theology, in history, in the study of the Bible, in the church's social doctrine, and in the liturgical movement, which was understood to be at the center of all of this. The church renewing and reforming itself out of a deeper experience of the sacred liturgy. And that mid 20th century Catholic Renaissance, of whom such figures as Jacques Maritain, Etienne Gilson, Yves Simon, Henri de Lubac, uh, and others were, were key uh, figures. That remarkable flowering of Catholic thought in philosophy, theology, history, biblical studies, liturgical studies, social studies, etc., that in turn made Vatican II possible. Indeed, as we approach this October 11th, the 50th anniversary of the first meeting of the Second Vatican Council, uh, I think it becomes ever more clear that Vatican II crystallized this arc of Leonine reform, this trajectory of Leonine reform at a moment of high ecclesiastical drama that lasted from 1962 to 1965. But, but, there was something different about Vatican II. Vatican II was the 21st ecumenical council in the history of the church. The preceding 20 councils had each provided keys for its own proper interpretation. If you want to know what the Council of Nicaea I was about in 325, you read the creed of the Council of Nicaea, which we do at Mass on Sundays and Solemnities. If you know, want to know what the Council of Ephesus was about, you read its dogmatic definition of Mary as Theotokos, Mother of God or God-bearer. If you want to know what the Council of Chalcedon a few years later was about, you read its dogmatic definition of two natures in the one divine person of Christ. If you want to know what the Council of Trent was about, you read its catechism, you read the canons it wrote into the law of the church, you read the things it anathematized and condemned, and so forth and so on. You want to know what Vatican I was about? You read its dogmatic definition of uh, the infallibility of the Pope when speaking ex cathedra on matters of faith and morals. Vatican II did none of that. There was no dogmatic definition. There was no condemnation, no anathemas. There were no canons, and there was no creed. What we had were 16 documents, but no keys to their proper interpretation. Let me suggest tonight that these two pontificates we're pondering, John Paul II and Benedict XVI, were two popes with one mission, namely to provide the keys for the authoritative interpretation of Vatican II. These were both men of the council. Karol Wojtyla as auxiliary bishop of Krakow and then archbishop of Krakow played a significant role in Vatican II during all four of its sessions and particularly in its third and fourth sessions. Joseph Ratzinger, who was then a 30-something, uh, very young uh, German uh, theologian, uh, was a major intellectual influence on the council uh, from the beginning in October 1962. So 
in this arc of reform, which begins <coughs> with Leo the Thirteenth, runs through that Catholic Renaissance of the mid 20th century, comes to a moment of high drama at Vatican II, followed by 15 years of chaos and confusion because there are no keys to interpret it. Finally, there are raised up these two figures, both men of the council, to provide the authoritative interpretation that was lacking. John Paul II uh, did this uh, in innumerable respects. There is very little in the extensive papal magisterium of John Paul II that is not an attempt to provide an authoritative interpretation of Vatican II. But we might look in particular at four moments in the pontificate, 1985, when the Pope summons a extraordinary session of the Synod of Bishops to consider the fruits of the Council 20 years after its conclusion and to ponder what went right and what went wrong. And that synod, which among other things mandated the Catechism of the Catholic Church, is another fruit of the Council, that synod attempting to find a connecting thread through those 16 documents proposes to the Church that the connecting thread the figure in the carpet, uh, as Henry James might have said, was the notion of the church as a communion, a communio in Latin, of disciples. A communio of disciples ordered to mission. In 1990, five years later, December of that year, John Paul II issues what is an often unremarked, but is perhaps the most important encyclical of his pontificate, Redem Torres Missio, the mission of the Redeemer, in which the Pope teaches that the Church does not have a mission, as if mission were one of a dozen things the Church does, rather the Church is a mission. Mission is the fundamental reality of the Church. The proclamation of the Gospel is the fundamental task of the, that communion of disciples uh, that the Synod had discussed. In 2000, during the great uh, jubilee, John Paul II took the church back, literally, in his person to its biblical roots during his Holy Land pilgrimages, not simply to visit the holy places, but to remind the church that this is where the conversion of the world began. In these places, at a certain moment in time, the gospel went forth. The mission of the church began. And then in concluding the Great Jubilee in 2001 with the apostolic letter Novo Millennio in Aunte, entering the new millennium, the Pope made this challenge quite specific, saying to the World Church that the past year has stretched our legs, this pilgrimage of the past year has stretched our legs for the journey ahead, and how should we understand that journey? We should understand it by analogy to the Lord telling the disciples to put out into the Lake of Galilee for a catch, put out into the deep, duc in altum, in, in the Latin, put out into the deep for a catch. In other words, John Paul II saw this whole arc of, of reform from Leo XIII on, and particularly that, if you will, the second half of the arc from Vatican II on, as a great spirit-led uh, effort to give the church a new experience of Pentecost. Why? so that the church would enter the third millennium of its history with a great sense of evangelical fervor uh, behind it and a rediscovery of itself as a mission. Benedict XVI has continued this authoritative interpretation of the council, this providing of the keys for the council's proper interpretation uh, by insisting in a variety of venues that Vatican II must be understood uh, 
not as a council of rupture with the past, but as a council of renewal and reform based on a reaching back into the rich tradition of the church and a rediscovery of elements of that patrimony that had been uh, forgotten. So, two popes, one mission, one council, two parallel and contiguous authoritative interpretations. And now we're at the end of that. So to what is that leading us? To say we're at the end of this period is not in any sense to say that the church is over. It's to say that a new phase in the history of the church is beginning. And this is the church that, as I said a moment ago, many of us have come to call the Church of Evangelical Catholicism. It has ten characteristics which I will sketch very, very briefly. First, Evangelical Catholicism is a Catholicism which emphasizes what Benedict XVI constantly calls friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Radical discipleship, a discipleship in which that friendship with the Lord is the central reality of the life of every Catholic, that, that's the church of the future. The church of the future is not one in which our discipleship can be a recreational activity, uh, can be simply one other part of who we are. It has to be at the center of who we are, uh, in part so that each of us can live out that uh, missionary mandate that was given us at our baptism. Secondly, this evangelical Catholicism of the third millennium will be a Catholicism that once again uh, takes its stand on what it believes are revealed truths. This evangelical Catholicism is not to be confused with what you see uh, shelved under spirituality in the bookstores. Go to the whatever bookstores are left these days, uh, or you go online and hit spirituality into your Google search at Amazon or BNN. And what comes up? An enormous amount of stuff about the human search for God. Man in search of God. The evangelical Catholicism of the future is going to say, no, that's not the way it works. Biblical religion is not about our search for God. It's about God's search for us. It's about God coming into history, revealing himself in word and deed, and summoning his people, first the people of Israel, later the people of the church, to follow the same path through history that God is taking. So it's not a question of being searchers, it's a question of being finders, or to put it slightly differently, a question of being found by this God who comes into history in search of us and who reveals not ideas about himself, but reveals himself, who shows us the face of the merciful Father in uh, the holy face of the Son, a Catholicism of revealed truths. Thirdly, this will be a Catholicism of renewed sacramental intensity in which all of the seven sacraments will be understood as privileged moments of encounter uh, with the Trinitarian God, but two of them will rise to a special place of importance, as indeed they have always had in the Church, baptism and the Holy Eucharist. Baptism will be understood uh, as our incorporation into this communio of disciples, which as John Paul II said at his uh, first public mass as Pope on October 22, 1978, uh, that baptism confers on every baptized person a priestly, prophetic, and kingly dignity. We are all to worship in the truth, to speak the truth, and to serve in the truth. The, 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 mode, the day of our baptism will loom ever larger 
in our imaginations, as will uh, the Holy Eucharist, which has always been, since the days of the 20th century liturgical movement, understood to be the hub from which all of this evangelical uh, activity in the church uh, proceeds. This will be a Catholicism in the fourth place of constant conversion of life. We'll understand that none of us gets all of this right all of the time, or even most of the time. Uh, so we will understand ourselves as all being in a constant process of conversion that involves the rejection of evil, the works of service and charity. Uh, we will all understand ourselves as finders who are being challenged daily to probe more deeply into the truth of what it means to be found by the triune God and embraced uh, in love by his son. This will be in the fifth place a church of higher liturgical seriousness. No more clown liturgies in the evangelical Catholicism of the future. Why? Because it's not a matter of taste, it's a matter of theological seriousness. This church of the future will understand that at Holy Mass we are in a privileged moment of encounter with the liturgy that goes on all the time around the throne of grace with the angels and saints. This is our window into the kingdom. This is our window into the future that is made possible for us by the death and resurrection of the Lord and our own baptism and our liturgical ceremonies will reflect that seriousness. That we, we are here at the throne of grace. We're not at another weekend recreational activity. We're at something quite uh, different. This will be a much more in the sixth place biblically literate Catholicism. I've emphasized sacrament uh, prior to this tonight, but this is going to be a Catholicism very much of word and sacrament uh, in which all will come to understand that uh, being fed daily on the Word of God in the Bible is an essential part of Catholic life, uh, an essential part of equipping ourselves for the different evangelical missions that each of us is called to uh, undertake. This means that the church is going to learn to read the Bible again with confidence uh, and that the uh, biblical text given to us uh, at Mass will be preached not in a form of kind of intellectual dissection, uh, but as the living Word of God, which has a word to say to us uh, today. This will be in the seventh place, a Catholicism that takes with utmost seriousness what Vatican II and the dogmatic constitution on the church called the universal call to holiness. Uh, and within that, this will be a church that rediscovers that hierarchy, authority, jurisdiction, power in the church are all meant to enable and empower discipleship. To enable and empower discipleship. This will be, in other words, a church at the very opposite of the imagination of the English bishop who once asked Blessed John Henry Newman, then Father John Henry Newman, tell me, Father, what are the laity for? Newman said, well, your grace, we would look rather silly without them. <laughs> Ordained authority in the church is for the empowerment of the discipleship of all and equipping the saints for mission. In the eighth place, this evangelical Catholicism of the future will be a culture-forming counterculture. It's going to be a counterculture. We are going to live differently, probably dress differently, certainly talk differently, hopefully behave differently than much of the ambient culture around us. But we're not building bunkers. We're not building catacombs. We're, we're entering and sh being shaped by that distinctive 
counterculture of the communion of disciples in order to go out and convert the ambient culture, which in many, sense, in many respects is going to mean knocking it over the head a bit and calling it to its senses, calling it to take seriously what it means about the dignity of the human person, uh, etc. And that is frankly going to put us um, at um, uh, odds with the principalities and powers uh, of the age from time to time. So this is going to be uh, a counterculture, a culture forming counterculture with edge. It's going to know how to uh, fight the good fight in uh, public life. And it's going to, in the ninth place, bring to that engagement with public life reason grounded in gospel conviction. Within the church, we will speak the distinctive vocabulary of Christian life, uh, the distinctive vocabulary that is formed by the gospel and friendship with the Lord. When we go out to do the things we must do to maintain uh, decent, uh, free, and virtuous societies, we will speak a language of reason grounded in gospel conviction so that our words might have a chance of being heard by those to whom we speak. Uh, I might just add parenthetically here that uh, the way to do this, uh, I think, uh, has been modeled in a particularly effective way for the past 35 years by the Catholic bishops of the United States on the question of the life issues. Uh, I get around the world church uh, fairly extensively and in no place other than the United States. Parts of Canada maybe, parts of Australia, but, but predominantly in the United States. The church has learned to make the case for the inalienable dignity and value of every human life from conception until natural death in a genuinely public vocabulary that cannot be dismissed as sectarian uh, stuff uh, that can only be understood by people of a particular theological cast of mind. Uh, this, is a, this is an enormous accomplishment uh, of the pro-life movement in general uh, and of the bishops uh, in particular and it's a model for uh, reason grounded in gospel conviction entering the public square. And finally, in summing all of this uh, up, uh, the evangelical Catholicism of the future will be a Catholicism ordered to mission. Uh, we are going to follow John Paul II's counsel in Novo Millennio in Aunte, leave the shallow waters of institutional maintenance and set out into the deep. This will be a mission-driven Catholicism in which mission measures everyone and everything. That means there are going to be some reforms required in how we train uh, our deacons and priests and how we select our bishops and how our Catholic institutions operate in the church's intellectual life and in the consecrated life of the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, all of which you will be happy to know I have laid out or will lay out in uh, excruciating detail in a book that will be published a year from now uh, called Evangelical Catholicism, Deep Reform in the Church, of which what you've heard tonight is a very brief sketch of the first half and the second half of the book is, okay, now what has to happen in all these sectors of the church's life for this uh, deep reform of the church? Uh, to unfold. Maybe I can come back and talk about this uh, again when it's uh, available. So, uh, we're at the end of a period, we're at the beginning of a new and I think uh, dramatic and exciting period that will be marked by the imperative of radical conversion, of deep fidelity, which everyone in the church will be asked to constantly reflect upon the question, can I say with integrity, what we ask those being received into full communion with the church at the Easter Vigil to say. Namely, I believe and profess as true everything the Holy Catholic Church teaches and professes to be true. This will be a Catholicism of joyful discipleship and a Catholicism of courageous evangelism. 
if you want it summarized in one phrase, perhaps that phrase would be strong truths well lived. Strong truths well lived. It's thanks to the great witness of John Paul II and Benedict XVI that we're in a position now to look forward to this future uh, with hope, uh, even amidst its uh, challenges. Uh, a pope of the mid-20th century, Pius XI, the pope who took on fascism, Nazism, communism, Mexican anti-clericalism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, once uh, said in a way that perhaps provides a capstone to our conversation tonight, let us thank God that he makes us live among the present challenges. It is no longer permitted to anyone to be mediocre. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Jerry. That was terrific. Thank you, George. Um, we will have some time for questions. I'd like to ask anyone who, who would like to ask a question to come up to the microphone. And I, I would just like to share a thought or two here in light of George's talk. You know, the Center for Thomistic Studies was founded by Father Brzezik, one of the great Brazilians, who I think does represent this um, spirit of Leo the 13th to renew St. Thomas. And although he does not go back as far as Leo the 13th, he, he was an elderly man when he died. I was impressed when I met him and I told him I was from Detroit. He told me when he went to the seminary in Toronto, they stopped in Detroit and they took in a Tigers game, but he was disappointed because Ty Cobb had retired two years before he saw the game. He did see Hank Greenberg, so the Bazillions have a great heritage in Houston, and I think that Center for Thomistic Studies is really a sign of that commitment. And also the John Paul II Forum, I think um, getting together with the Center for this conference, I, I, I forgot to mention this, there is a brochure on some of your seats about this conference in 2013 in which we will have uh, a cooperative venture with the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas, which was founded by Leo XIII, the Center for Thomistic Studies founded by Father Brzezik and the John Paul II Forum to um, look at how John Paul II used St. Thomas as a key to understanding Vatican II and all these great um, I think challenges that George Weigel has so well laid out. So if you can um, get on our mailing list and keep in touch with us, I would like to keep you posted on our events. But let's have some time for questions. If anyone would like to ask one, I would ask that you come to the mic simply because um, it is a large uh, auditorium here and uh, everyone can hear. Father Francois? Thank you for your talk. Uh, in one of your book, uh, it's called Sovereignty of Christ in the Public Church. You say somewhere at the end of the article, um, in short, a public church in a civil society served by a limited state. I want to know, Do you hear? Yes. Good. So I want to hear about uh, what is coming for countries in Europe, and especially Canada, from Canada. Uh, do you expect those kind of uh, social democracies, you know, on the left, to fail and then open up to the faith? Because right now it's a problem. I'm thinking of Europe, for example. So what is the future of those countries and the, the role politics will play for Christians, for them or against them? 
Well, I think uh, we could be here for a couple of hours pondering that. I mean, it's a very, it's a very deep and, and broad question. Um, the fundamental reality of European uh, life today is that Europe is in a kind of demographic winter uh, of willful infertility, uh, which, has, which is the demographic empirical root at the bottom of much of the crisis of the European welfare state today. There simply aren't enough people to pay for uh, this uh, extraordinary level of spending on, on social service. Uh, I think there, is, uh, there are obvious and uh, clear linkages between that self-induced infertility, uh, which is also true in, for example, Quebec, which is Europe moved to, to North America in a very powerful way, uh, and the abandonment of the God of the Bible. Uh, when you throw the God of the Bible over the side, it seems that one of the things that goes over the side with him is his first commandment, uh, which is not that he is God, it's be fruitful and multiply. Uh, there's a real, uh, so in other words, at the, at the bottom of the fiscal, uh, economic, and increasingly political mess of Europe seems to me to be severe demographic problems, and at the root of those are problems of spiritual culture of a very uh, profound uh, sort. The answer to that has to be uh, the new evangelization in the form of, of the reconversion of these places. Uh, that is not, in my view, going to come if it comes, uh, that is not likely to come from the ordinary structures of Catholic life. Uh, it will come from renewal movements, new forms of Catholic community, that's the way this has always worked in the past. And then the question is how to reincorporate those or incorporate those into the normal parochial and diocesan life of the church. But um, it's not looking real good right now. Uh, it's not looking real good right now. And, um, you know, therefore, of course, one also has to say it didn't look too good in 1805. You know, you had, you had two popes kidnapped by the armies of revolutionary France. Uh, the pope was out of Rome for three years, Pius VII, as a prisoner of Napoleon. No one at that point would have expected this enormous um, efflorescence of religious life in Europe, many new religious congregations being formed, the extraordinary missionary activity that flowed out of Europe in the 19th century and so forth and so on. These are all works of the Holy Spirit, and we're not in charge of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but what we can do is get out of the way of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and um, I will have some things to say about that in terms of ecclesial reform in, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, book. Uh, in our own situation, you mentioned, I, what did I say, something or other, uh, free church in a something or other in a limited state. Well, th that's what's really at contest in the United States today. I mean, are we going to have a limited state, meaning a limited federal government, or aren't we? Uh, beneath this whole fuss of the past uh, three weeks uh, over the HHS uh, mandate is the question of whether the institutions of civil society not just the church, but individual employers, businesses, nonprofits, etc., are going to be able to conduct uh, themselves according to their own uh, moral uh, standards, or, or is the dictatorship of relativism, as the present pope called it, going to be imposed by coercive state power at the tune of $5,000 per employee? Um, that's what's going on. Question about um, prayer, and I, I have two parts to the question. The first part is that in the in Pope John Paul II's writings, he was in his life mentioned this phrase, contemplating the face of Christ, many times in, in, in his document on the Rosary, in Testimony of the Unite, in Ecclesia of Gracia, and in Mani and the Bishop of the Eucharist, also. And, and so, to me, 
He's pointing to prayer. But, but I don't know why didn't he just say, we need to pray. He said, we need to contemplate the face of Christ. And I don't know if you can... The second part of it, is this saying something about how we need to pray differently or better? I mean, we need to pray better, obviously. But it, did Pope John Paul kind of point to some ways of prayer as part of it? Well, um, let me try to locate that uh, the notion of the face in a, perhaps a little bit larger context. Um, uh, if you look at uh, the, one of the two most quoted uh, texts from the documents of Vatican II, in the extraordinarily extensive Magisterium of John Paul II. Uh, one is the famous Gaudium et Spes 24, uh, this law of self-giving built into the human person. And the other is Gaudium et Spes 22, in which the Council Fathers write that in seeing the Lord Jesus, particularly seeing his transfigured face, uh, we see both the truth about our humanity and the truth about God. So the Lord Jesus not only reveals the truth of the Father, he reveals the truth about us. And it's in that shining face of Mount Tabor that in a sense the two of those come together. Um, I think John Paul II had an acute sense of um, the enormous burden of guilt borne by the modern world for what it had done to itself. Uh, in Europe, of course, this takes particular form in the slaughters of the First and Second World War, the Holocaust of European Jewry, the Gulag, the Ukrainian terror famine, and all the rest of the parade of horribles. This, this extends all over the world, as we know. Uh, tens of millions of people starved to death in China, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the problem the Pope saw was that there was no way to expiate that. Because if you had thrown the God of the Bible over the side, to whom are you going to confess this guilt? Who can offer forgiveness? That's why the parable of the prodigal son, which of course should really be called the parable of the merciful father, was so important in his thinking about the moral life. Uh, if you think of the great Rembrandt painting of, of the merciful father embracing and lifting up the, the prodigal son, that was a face or facet of the divine that the Pope believed was being turned in a particular way towards the world at this moment uh, because it's what the world needed at this moment. I think that's one reason why the divine mercy devotion was for John Paul II not an interesting little moment in mid 20th century Polish popular piety but a message with a universal um, Residents. The whole world needed to hear about the divine mercy. So maybe that gives you a few things in which to locate that. Okay. I was, one, I was wondering a little bit about, um, you mentioned in a couple places the countercultural nature of the church coming in the years. Um, public expression and public uh, engagement. And I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate on what you might think some of those modes and expressions of being engaging in the culture, and, um, uh, public engagement and public expression of that faith, and part two, I guess. Uh, what will the role of that religious and theological education play in that? Well, let me just take one example to, to heighten the contrast here. Uh, <clears throat> there has been, since the HHS thing came out, uh, there's been a lot of talk about protecting conscience rights. Uh, I have argued uh, intensely that this is the wrong way to formulate this. Because what we mean by conscience in the church 
is not what the culture means by conscience. What the culture means by conscience is I have an idea of what I want to do and I have a right to do it. What we mean by conscience is moral judgment tethered to truth and accountable to truth. Those are two very different things. What we need to be arguing about is religious freedom and the protection of the institute, the constitutional protection of the institutions of civil society to be uh, themselves. Uh, that, that's the ground on which this needs to be fought. Um, now, what that also suggests is that a long-term task, if you wish to take this on, I commend you for it, I will be watching on CNN Purgatory to see how you uh, do, um, is to teach the culture, this counterculture needs to teach the culture about the truth of conscience. But in order to do that, it's going to have to reteach the culture that there is something beyond your truth and my truth. There's something called the truth. And it's accessible to uh, reason, and for people of faith, it's accessible through revelation uh, as well. Uh, the two biggest uh, issues for the public church of the foreseeable future are going to be the life issues uh, and whether we are going to avoid uh, Huxley's Brave New World. Um, so that means the whole gamut of questions from abortion to euthanasia to the radically handicapped to the remanufacture of the human condition uh, by genetic engineering and so-called enhancement uh, and so forth and frankly religious freedom. I mean now, I mean this is when I first started pushing this a couple of years ago I think people thought I was getting a little um, uh, upset a little too early. Uh, but the handwriting was clearly on the wall as to what, what was coming here. And I think it's now been made manifestly clear. Uh, is this going to remain the first of our liberties or is it going to be whittled away to a kind of privacy right in which you and I can engage in uh, bizarre by the standards of the public culture recreational activity from 9 to 10 Sunday morning. Uh, but that's it. I mean that's they won't mess with us on that, but they'll mess with everything else. Um, that's, this is a big, and of course this is a huge issue for the whole society. This is, we're not fighting this fight now for ourselves alone. Okay? Yeah. Maybe we'll take two more. I'm getting a bit of a frog in the throat here. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. I um, actually had a, a question playing on the common culture. Um, I don't know, in my view of the church, it seems like we're the most consistent display of God's love and mercy. And to, to characterize it as a counterculture, and not to say that we're actually the culture, um, it implies that we're kind of adapting to the world. Um, and the whole friendship with Jesus Christ, it, I mean, it seems like it impedes on the relationship that uh, the father-child relationship that we should have with God, and um, to have to characterize us as God finders and not searchers. Um, it kind of reminds me of uh, when Joseph and Mary left Jesus at the temple, and they go back and they find him at the temple, and he's like, "I was going about my father's business." It's kind of hard to see that we're searching or finding someone who never left us in the first place, and. Um, well, going with John Paul also, um, he had a devotion to the Divine Mercy. And I was wondering, because um, most Catholics, more or less, they go about to Mass 20 times a year. So that means they, they take on the, the Sacrament of uh, Communion about 20 times a year. But hardly ever do we really go to confession and reconciliation. Is there not a plan to emphasize that during this whole congratulation? Of yeah. No, that's, that's a good point. I mean, I... Uh, in the book, I, I say that you know, part of this radical discipleship and equipment for mission is a rediscovery of the importance of regular sacramental uh, confession. Um, uh, it's an amazement to me that just when the rest of the culture, the broader ambient culture of the society, begins to spend inordinate amounts of money on therapy, 
uh, we sort of threw out the, uh, uh, the discussion of personal issues and problems and whatnot. That was an integral part, not only of confession, but of spiritual direction. And uh, obviously that needs to be, uh, needs to be recovered uh, uh, again. Okay? Thank you. Last. I'm Pat Wood. First of all, thank you for that stellar article you wrote on the Texas A&M Catholic Student Center last year. It was, it was, it was dead on. Is that the right thing? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that one. I know that. Thank you, Speaker Office. We'd love to see that model replicated in every diocese in the world. Um, I grew up in a pretty heavily Protestant culture, and I, when I read your 10 points and I think about evangelical Catholicism, that's exciting to me. So thank you for giving us all the things to hope. But I wonder, are there some lessons pro and con we can learn from the past century and a half of evangelical Protestantism that could maybe help us avoid mistakes or kind of use the mission forward? Well, I think the first um, uh, <laughs> one story. Uh, I have been in active conversation both in terms of coalitional political stuff as well as fairly highbrow theological uh, conversation with evangelical Protestants for about 25 years now. And when I first started engaging in this, which was having to do with life issues and other matters, I found that these evangelical brethren had a very interesting way of beginning a meeting. You'd have 15 people sitting around a table, and everybody's introducing themselves, and the guy would say, I'm John Smith, and I was born again on you know, such and such a date that was 20 years ago, and I'm Mary Jones, and I was born again on such and such a date 10 years ago. And I would always say, uh, I'm George Weigel, and I was born again on April 29th, 1951, at which point I was 12 days old. Uh, <laughs> this was putting down a little... Um, putting down a little uh, sacramental marker so that eventually we'd get around to word and sacrament here. Uh, what I th have found most impressive about the literally thousands of evangelical brethren I have worked with over the past quarter of a century is their unapologetically missionary sense of their own law. Uh, I think it was in the Metroplex, actually, where I first saw this. Uh, but it was one of these huge mega churches. Um, and uh, it had been constructed in an odd way so that there was only one exit from the equally huge parking lot. So everybody had to go through the same exit on the way out. And there was, a, there was a sign there that looked like it could have been put up by the county um, roads department, but looked like your ordinary road sign. But in fact, it was put up by the church. And everybody leaving that church read every Sunday, you are entering mission territory. And I thought, you know, we should have a few of those up around our parking lots, uh, too. Uh, that's one thing we can learn from that. Uh, this constant recourse to uh, the Word of God as contained in the words of God in the Bible, I think, is a very important part of nurturing the Catholicism of the future. Uh, too. Uh, the parishes I know which are already living this uh, model of the Catholicism of the future are parishes in which people are urged to spend at least 10 or 15 minutes a day uh, simply reading the Gospels. Um, that's no bad thing for every, uh, every parish uh, uh, to be doing. Um, and I guess the third thing is this this profound sense of gratitude for having been saved. Um, that's something that's not part of the normal emotional equipment of cradle Catholics. 
but it ought to be. I mean, we ought to have a very profound sense, particularly during the triduum of Holy Week, of, of uh, gratitude uh, for being saved. And of course, the Pauline literature in the New Testament is, is just replete with wonderful material uh, to reflect uh, on that. So I, those are several things that uh, occur to me uh, from, uh, from that world. Thank you all very much. I hope to see some of you in the back. Thank you.